Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being with us this whole week, and it's been a true blessing to be here. Have you not been blessed by the presentations? God is truly raising up a generation, and this has been a significant weekend of God's hand showing that He is still guiding His church and His people to be prepared for His coming. I'm going to offer a short word of prayer and we'll get right into the message. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time to be together. I pray that you would guide me as I speak. May we be motivated and challenged to not only be hearers of the word, but to be doers of the word as well, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The title for this last presentation is End Time Soul Winners. You know, we've heard a lot this weekend about correct theology, and that's very important. It's important to understand who we are, what our purpose is as a Seventh-day Adventist, and how God has called us to live in these last days. And part of that has to do with evangelism within the framework of biblical Adventism. This is the often missing piece in character development. Now, I'm going to read to you a statement. This is from Selected Messages, Volume 3, page 259, and this is sometimes used as a justification to not do evangelism. But Notice what this statement says. God calls upon the workers in this mission to elevate the standard and to show them their regard for his requirements by honoring the Sabbath. From this place, the publications are sent out and the laborers go forth to proclaim the commandments of God, and it is of the greatest importance that a right influence be exerted by this church, both by precept and example. Now listen to this. The standard must not be placed so low that those who accept the truth shall transgress God's commandments while professing to obey them. Better, far better, would it be to leave them in darkness until they could receive the truth in its purity. Now, here's the the challenge. Sometimes we hear of stories of evangelism that is being done improperly. And I one time lived somewhere outside of the United States where an evangelistic crusade was done where the only thing basically the converts were learning was maybe about the Sabbath and the state of the dead, perhaps, but we received stories that within a few weeks after their baptism, they were calling their new Adventist pastor to perform last rites for their grandparents that were dying. And so that's obviously not the type of evangelism that God is calling us to do. There's obviously examples we could think of here in North America as well. So there are times when it would be better to leave people in darkness until they could receive the truth in its purity. But I believe that sometimes we have this mentality of not doing evangelism as an excuse for our own lack of unfaithfulness and our lack of surrender. We, we say, well, if we bring them in, they're going to come into a place that isn't really ready to receive them, so let's just not do evangelism. But that's not what God has called us to do. Many have been discouraged from doing evangelism in the church because it has been done in an improper way. Perhaps we are focused on making sure our church has its theology correct and we will engage in in evangelism later. Now, clearly more work needs to be done in educating churches to do evangelism properly, but that doesn't mean we don't do evangelism. Now, evangelism rightly done is the final and vital piece to last generation theology. Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7, describing the first angel's message, says that the everlasting gospel is going to be preached to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Now let me say something to you very clearly here. That does not simply mean speaking to fellow Seventh-day Adventists, right? That means taking the true gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And then Jesus says in Matthew 24, verse 14, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness to all nations, and then the end shall come. Now, here is one of the keys that perhaps we haven't understood. The proclamation of the gospel alone is not the the entire witness that the gospel needs to be in order for the end to come. Now, why do I say that? Here's what I mean. 
Let's just say hypothetically, and we live in a technology age where it is now more possible through technology to get the gospel to the remote corners of the earth than it ever has been. And let's just say for hypothetical sake that one of our leading evangelists, let's just use Pastor Doug Batchelor since he's not far from here, let's say we could get Pastor Batchelor onto every screen or television or phone or whatever it was throughout the world and he gave uh, an exposition of the true biblical gospel. There was no error in it and he preaches the, the true gospel and there was no error in it and everybody heard it and he did it as well as it could be preached. Would that lead to the end of all things? The answer is no, because it's not simply a proclamation that needs to be taken to the world. It's a demonstration. And that's one of the reasons why we're having this symposium this weekend, is because that in order for the gospel to be rightly demonstrated, we need to have a right understanding of what the true gospel is, so that we really can believe that we can be like Jesus through his grace and strength, so that when we share Jesus with others, they are not hearing simply about Jesus, they are interacting with Jesus through us. That is what will t lead us to the end of all things. In Revelation 18.1, I talked about this last night, the earth will be illuminated with the glory of God's character when the latter rain is poured out and people will see this is what it means to be like Jesus. That is what proper evangelism will do in the framework of last generation theology. Listen, if all you gain from being here this weekend is walking away to say, okay, now I understand the correct theology, I'm not going to be deceived, and it will keep me from doing bad things, but then you don't go out with a heart motivated to share Jesus with others, I'll be honest with you, it's not going to do you a lot of good. There has to be more than an intellectual understanding of what right theology is, and that is crucial. It's important because correct theology is under attack in the church. But then again, that is not enough. There has to be an experiential change in response to the true gospel that will lead to the gospel being taken to the world as a witness. Now, notice this statement. We've heard this Already, this is Desire of Ages 633. Before the fall of Jerusalem, Paul, writing by the Holy Spirit, declared that the gospel was preached to every creature which is under heaven. So, you know, the disciples of that generation, they accomplished the gospel commission by taking the gospel to every creature which is under heaven in the known territory that they had. Notice what she says. So now, before the coming of the Son of Man, the everlasting gospel is to be preached to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. God hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world. Now, some people use Acts 17.31 to say that God has already appointed a time when probation will close and things will wrap up. But Ellen White tells us what that text means. Notice what she says. Christ tells us when that day shall be ushered in. He does not say that all the world will be converted, but that this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Now notice this, by giving the gospel to the world, it is in our power to hasten our Lord's return. So it's not simply enough to stop doing bad things. It, the character of Christ being perfectly reproduced in our lives doesn't simply mean that we stop doing bad things. It means that we will give the gospel to the world the way Jesus reached people while he was on this earth. That's part of character perfection, is being a soul winner and an evangelist the way Jesus was. By giving the gospel to the world, it is in our power to hasten our Lord's return. We are not only to look for, but to hasten the coming of the day of God. Had the church of Christ done her appointed work as the Lord ordained, the whole world would, before this, have been warned, and the Lord Jesus would have come to our earth in power and great glory. And we have to ask ourselves the question, are we giving the true gospel to the world, not simply as a proclamation, but as a witness in our lives? 
Now, let me ask you a few penetrating questions. How many Seventh-day Adventists, including yourself, do you know that are truly excited about evangelism? How many Seventh-day Adventists do you know that are actively engaged in evangelism? How many people have you heard that say soul winning and evangelism are not their gift? Do you know that I would venture to say that 99% of the churches that I, that I visit and speak at, that is the mentality of the church members? Soul winning is not my gift. I'm not an evangelist. Other people may have that gift, but it's not me. I'm not good at knocking on doors. I'm not good about sharing my faith. I can't do it. But the reality is, is that if you have Jesus in your life, you're going to be a soul winner. You may not be speaking in front of a thousand people at an evangelistic crusade, but you will be soul winning. And Jesus found the one-on-one -on -one audience, as he did with Nicodemus, the most effective form of soul winning. Anybody can do that. Now, we're good at little cliches such as this. I'm a silent witness. Preach the gospel, use words when necessary. And listen, if we're honest with ourselves, our silent witness of preaching, in quotes, the gospel without words is so ineffective that many don't even know that we're Christians. I'm a silent witness. Yes, you are. Don't kid yourself and fool yourself. Listen, there is a time and a place that, to be a silent witness, sure, but there is also a time to speak words or people won't hear the preaching of the gospel. There has to be the invitation, come and follow me. You can't just be a silent witness your whole life and say, I was a silent witness for Jesus. Well, yeah, you were a silent witness and it didn't go anywhere. I've heard some say, I'm not into evangelism now, but when the loud cry goes forth, then I will become active in soul winning and evangelism. That's like saying I'll surrender my life to Jesus when the Sunday law is passed. You really think that you're going to suddenly have a, a switch flipped in your brain and suddenly become interested in something that you didn't enjoy doing prior to the outpouring of the latter rain? No, the latter rain is simply going to accentuate and, an, and empower that which was already in development. So if there's no evangelistic desire and soul winning desire in your heart now, is you're not suddenly going to go from no growth, zero growth to best soul winner the world's ever seen. That's not going to happen. When we love Jesus... We will share Jesus. And when we have a converted heart and a surrendered heart, people will see it. This is a powerful statement from Medical Ministry, page 49. Christ was a Seventh-day Adventist to all intents and purposes. The question is, are you a Seventh-day Adventist to all intents and purposes? When the character of Christ is perfectly reproduced in your life, you will be a Seventh-day Adventist to all intents and purposes. And what did Christ do? Ministry of Healing, 143. The world needs today what it needed 1,900 years ago, a revelation of Christ. A great work of reform is demanded, and it is only through the grace of Christ that the work of restoration, physical, mental, and spiritual, can be accomplished Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he bade them follow me. Now, I'll have to admit that as a physician, I do feel like I have an extra advantage because I'm in a position every day in my office to meet people where they are and to gain their confidence and to show them that people really do care about them. But you don't have to be an MD to do what this quote says. 
Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with, one, with men as one who desired their good. Now, there are times and places to give messages of warning, but generally speaking, if you think that you can pay for like a billboard to say the Pope is the Antichrist, and somehow people are going to come and respond to the phone number you put up on the billboard and say, hey, can you tell me more? You might get a few sincere people who are studying and searching, but most people are never going to give you the time of day and don't say that you're using Christ's method alone. That's not effective soul-winning methods, but Christ's method is effective, and it, his method alone will give true success in reaching the people. When we are converted, when the character of Christ is reproduced in our lives, we will mingle with men as one who desires their good. We're not going to be doing soul winning as a checklist thing to say, see, Lord, I tried to share about you. I had a few tracts that I handed out and nobody was interested, but I tried. No, when you love Jesus and you're surrendered to him, he is going to bring opportunities your way all of the time. You know, I had an amazing experience in my office this week. I, I have pharmaceutical representatives who call upon me um, based on various medical conditions. They want me to prescribe their products. And it just so happens that a pharmaceutical representative found some of my sermons online. She'd been calling on me for a little while. And she came in. And she said something very interesting. You know, I'd been listening to this pastor in California a few years ago, and he was a Seventh-day Adventist. I was like, was that Doug Batchelor? She's like, yes. She's like, but he, he was kind of leading me, or I was following along, and then I kind of stopped listening. But what you were saying sounded like the same thing. And then she wanted to know more. And I gave her the great controversy and, and I'm praying for it and I'm going to see where the Lord leads. And there's other stories that I could tell you that are very similar. The Lord is going to give you these opportunities and sometimes you have to be intentional. Sometimes they'll come your way more naturally. But Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. And we're not going to just sit back and say, okay, I understand last generation theology now. I'll let the evangelists do the work of evangelism. God is going to use us to reach the world. Amen. Review and Herald, July 16, 1895. Those who do not submit to the influence of the Holy Spirit soon lose the blessings received when they acknowledge the truth is from heaven. They fall into a cold, spiritless formality. They lose their interest in perishing souls. They have left their first love. That's Review and Herald, July 16, 1895. If you have lost interest in perishing souls, you have left your first love. Again, it's not enough to know what is true theology. If you don't have an interest in the world around you and the people that you are interacting with that are lost, you have left your first love. Now, this is Christ, Object Lessons 384. The sanctification of the soul by the working of the Holy Spirit is the implanting of Christ's nature in humanity. Gospel religion is Christ in the life, a living act of principle. It is the grace of Christ revealed in character and wrought out in good works. The principles of the gospel cannot be disconnected from any department of practical life. Every line of Christian experience and labor is to be a representation of the life of Christ. Did you see that? Every line of Christian experience and labor is to be a representation of the life of Christ. Now, this is the powerful statement here. Love is the basis, basis of godliness. Whatever the profession, no man has pure love to God unless he has unselfish love for his brother. But we can never come into possession of the Spirit by trying to love others. What is needed is the love of Christ in the heart. When self is merged in Christ, love springs forth spontaneously. If you're finding it a hard time to love people, it's because Christ is not in your heart. That's the honest reality. Now notice the next sentence. The completeness of Christian character is attained when the impulse to help and bless others springs constantly from within. 
when the sunshine of heaven fills the heart and is revealed in the countenance. Look, last generation theology talks about the character of Christ being perfectly reproduced so that Christ can come to claim his people as his own. Listen, when Christ comes, I'm afraid there's going to be some foolish virgins that are going to be saying, Lord, Lord, did we not know the correct theology and didn't we point out error? How could you deny us an entrance into the kingdom of heaven? Listen, Jesus is not coming to claim as his own people who sit around merely to understand theology without being a blessing to others. Jesus is coming to claim as his own those who have the completeness of Christian character, who have within their hearts constantly an impulse to help and bless others. And we're not going to be making excuses saying, oh, that's not my gift to be a blessing. Well, if it's not your gift, it's because Christ is not living in your heart. This is the practicality of last generation theology. Yes, we have a right understanding of all of the theology, and it leads to a practical demonstration of Christ-likeness, which is an evangelistic mentality that leads others to be like Jesus as well. Acts 2.47 says, The Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. A spirit-filled church will have genuine soul winning and evangelism. Now, I've re I read this statement last night, so I'm just going to hit some high points. If you look halfway down the slide, Christ is seeking to reproduce himself in the hearts of men, and he does this through those who believe in him. The object of the Christian life is fruit-bearing, the reproduction of Christ's character in the believer that it may be reproduced in others. So notice, it's the reproduction of Christ's character in the believer. We're not simply trying to win members, we're trying to win disciples who will also be like Jesus. Christ object lesson 67. And then this next statement is similar. Now, if you go halfway down again, as you receive the spirit of Christ, the spirit of unselfish love and labor for others, you will grow and bring forth fruit. The graces of the spirit will ripen in your character. More and more, you will reflect the likeness of Christ in all that is pure, noble, and lovely. And then we see what the fruits of the Spirit are. We talked about that last night. And this fruit can never perish, but will produce after its kind a harvest unto eternal life. Now, I, I may have mentioned this in a similar way last night, but let me say it this way. If you try to share with others our faith and you're annoying, obnoxious, and hard to dialogue with, they're not going to want anything to do with our faith. And I'll be honest, sometimes and this is my pet peeve as a speaker, sometimes people will come and talk to me and they're kind of pushy with their views and sometimes it's just a turn off. And if we're going to win people to the truth, there needs to be the fruits of the Spirit in the way we dialogue with other people. And then we have this statement, when the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will cl come to claim them as his own. Christ's Object Lessons, page 69. And this will happen when the harvest is ready. Immediately, Christ will put in the sickle. He is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself and his church. And, you know, I'm thankful I'm not God. Can you imagine how God feels sometime? looking down at the Laodicean Seventh-day Adventist Church, and we're sitting around saying, we're rich and increased with goods and we don't need anything. And God is saying, well, if you don't need anything, how come you're not going out and reaching a lost and dying world with the last message of mercy that I've given you to give to them? We're just sitting around in our nice homes, and nice lifestyle here in North America where we are blessed beyond our imagination, and yet God has given us these means and these talents to be a blessing to a lost and dying world. 
Christ Object Lesson 69, it is the privilege of every Christian not only to look for, but to hasten the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're all who profess his name, bearing fruit to his glory, how quickly the whole world would be sown with the seed of the gospel. Quickly the last great harvest would be ripened and Christ would come to gather the precious grain. Friends, if we come to a clear understanding of what truth is and if we receive Jesus in all of his fullness and we do the work that he has called us to do, to con- constantly be a blessing to others, quickly the world will be sown with the seed of the gospel and Jesus will come back. If you think that simply understanding theology is going to cause Jesus to come back, that's only the first step in the process. John 4.35 tells us that the fields are why all ready to harvest. What are we waiting for? Why are we not working to reach the harvest of the world? Great Controversy 464 says, Notwithstanding the widespread declension of faith and piety, there are true followers of Christ in these churches. These are the churches outside of Adventism. Before the final visitation of God's judgments upon the earth, there will be among the people of the Lord such a revival of primitive godliness as has not been witnessed since apostolic times. Let me tell you something. The future of Adventism and Christianity is not a declension into worldliness. The future of Adventism and the followers of God throughout Christianity is a revival of primitive godliness as has not been witnessed since apostolic times. The spirit and power of God will be poured out upon his children. At that time, many will separate themselves from those churches in which the love of this world has supplanted love for God and his word. Many, both of ministers and people, will gladly accept those great truths which God has caused to be proclaimed at this time to prepare a people for the Lord's second coming. And then I like this statement, Great Controversy 611. The great work of the gospel is not to close with less manifestation of the power of God than marked its opening. The prophecies which were fulfilled in the outpouring of the former reign at the opening of the gospel are again to be fulfilled in the latter reign at its close. Here are the times of refreshing to which the apostle Peter looked forward when he said, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus. Servants of God with their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration will hasten from place to place to proclaim the message from heaven. Friends, when the latter reign is poured out, we are going to be hastening from place to place to proclaim the message. But again, if you aren't interested in sharing the message with the opportunities that God gives you now, you're not going to be part of that work at the end of time. Miracles will be wrought, the sick will be healed, and signs and wonders will follow the believers. And then the last sentence says, thus the inhabitants of the earth will be brought to take their stand. Now this is, these are my concluding thoughts. God will vindicate himself and return to this earth when he has a generation who are a reproduction of his character and who are actively engaged in bearing fruit to others, constantly having an impulse to be a blessing to others. It is not enough to know the truth and to refrain from sinning. As Christ Object Lessons 384 says, the completeness of Christian character is attained when the impulse to help and bless others springs constantly from within. And I hope that that's what you take away from the symposium is to, by the grace of God, develop the completeness of Christian character so that you will be a blessing to other people. And Christ's Object Lessons 4.15, those who wait for the bridegroom's coming are to say to the people, behold your God. The last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of his character of love. The children of God are to manifest his glory in their own life and character. They are to reveal what the grace of God has done for them. Friends, I want to make an appeal to you. Now is the time for us as Seventh-day Adventists to be surrendering our lives to the Lord and asking the Holy Spirit to reveal the sins in our life that so easily beset us so that we we can have the impurities of our lives removed so that Jesus can be seen fully in us. And we won't simply stop doing bad things. God will empower us to then go out and be evangelistic so that we will be the best soul winners that the world has ever seen. 
not for our glory, but for the glory of God and for the hastening of his soon return so that Jesus can come in power and glory. And when he comes for his people, he will, sell, he will say, well done thou good and faithful servant, enter thou into the joy of my Lord. He, he is saying these are the people who went out and were a blessing to others the way Jesus was a blessing while he was on this earth. And that is who we want to be, amen? By the grace of God, may we surrender our lives so that we will not only have a high standard and understand theology, but that we will be soul winners working in harmony with Christ. Amen. Is that what you want? I invite you to stand with me as we close with prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you that you have given us a gospel commission to take this message to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Thank you, Lord, for the everlasting gospel that has not changed. This gospel gives us forgiveness for sin and power to keep from sinning, and it's also a gospel of good news that when we are surrendered the Lord to the Lord, we want to share with everyone who has interest. Lord, open the doors for us to be a blessing to others. Forgive us for where we've fallen short in that way. And may we be a demonstration of the completeness of Christian character by having the impulse constantly springing from within to be a blessing to other people. That is my prayer. May we be faithful and may we be found in the kingdom. And may Jesus come soon, I pray in his name. Amen.